Hello and welcome to the Vestibular Disorders Association's Making Vestibular Visible. I'm Dr. Kathleen Strauss, a vestibular physical therapist and volunteer with VITA. Today's event is part of our Ask the Expert series. We're engaging in roundtable discussions with renowned clinical experts who evaluate and treat people with vestibular disorders. Dr. Habib Rizik and his clinical team today will discuss how they work together to coordinate care for their vestibular patients. They're coming to us from the Medical University of South Carolina and their dizziness evaluation and management program. Using a case study today, they're going to demonstrate the roles that neuroautology, audiology, and physical therapy play in the management of dizziness, vertigo, and imbalance. This presentation will be for both patients and clinicians. The event is recorded both as a video event that you're watching now and an audio only podcast. So if you're looking for looking at us or listening to us through the podcast, you can find us anywhere podcasts are streaming and you can click the link in the description box below to go to those. Um, and if you're listening to the to the audio only portion, you can find us on video as well with vestibular dot um, org and find the YouTube videos there. Today we're going to be visiting with neuroautologist Dr. Habib Rizik, physical therapist Rebecca English, and audiologist Christina Strange, and they're going to discuss their roles in the care of patients with vestibular disorders, and I'm really looking forward to it. Before I bring them on, let me just tell you about this distinguished panel that we have today. Dr. Rizik is the director of the vestibular program at the Medical University of South Carolina's Department of Otolaryngology head and neck surgery, where he established a multidisciplinary dizziness evaluation and management program, which evaluates several thousand patients per year and is heavily involved in research. Dr. Rizik is currently the board president of the Vestibular Disorders Association and a member of the American Balance Society and the Barony Society. He's also support, he is also a part of the Autology, Neuroautology Education Committee of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. Rebecca English next, she earned her dual degrees in occupational and physical therapy, wow, and she has a master's in rehab science and competencies from Emory University's School of Medicine in vestibular function testing and interpretation. She's an adjunct professor at the Medical University of South Carolina, teaching coursework related to vestibular and movement disorder dysfunction and concussion management, where she's also a member of the, uh, in doing clinical research and is also a clinician. Christine Strange comes to us with 30 years of experience in the evaluation of auditory and vestibular disorders. She's an instructor at the Medical University of South Carolina's vestibular program, and she currently is involved in clinical care and with most of those um, efforts on vestibular diagnostic testing. She's active in educating otolaryngology residents, fellows, and medical students, and her most recent research has focused on vestibular migraines and Meniere's disease. And you may have recalled Vita has, has done a deep dive into vestibular migraines that I did with Dr. Rizik, where we discussed care gaps in the treatment of migraine patients. My disclaimer today is that the views and opinions expressed here are not necessarily the views or opinions of the Vestibular Disorders Association, myself, or the board of directors. They constitute the views and opinions of our guests. As always, consult with your healthcare professional before starting or modifying your treatment plan. So welcome, welcome to the team. I'm glad you're here. Let me get you on stage. There you Hello, go. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with that tongue twisting introduction. I think there's a lot of things I could talk about that are easier to say, but I. <laughs> sure. Obviously. Thank you for that introduction and glad to be here. Absolutely. I'm excited today because uh, clinical vestibular rehabilitation is my field and I have always valued, highly valued the importance of the multidisciplinary team in this uh, caring for these unique patients, disciplinary approach to care. Dr. Rizek? So, I mean, multidisciplinary approach to care usually is in relation to complex disorders where one specialty or one discipline is not able to comprehensively manage the patient. 
And as we all know, those who treat vestibular disorders on a routine basis, nobody can do it in a silo. Um, you need an MD, but also within the MD, there's multiple specialties that are involved, whether neurology, neuroautology, psychiatry in some instances, but also the uh, close work with vestibular therapy and rehabilitation services and audiology for diagnostic purposes. And you can expand that multidisciplinary approach for example, in our clinic, we have a nutritionist who helps in certain disorders like migraine and Meniere's. Uh, we have every now and then, we're lucky to have a pharmacist spend time with us and helps us manage medications. And then we have close relationships with uh, the neurology department mostly. Um, psychology is another part of the workhorse of the multidisciplinary approach in vestibular disorders. And um, while I would like to say we have uh, good uh, relationship with psychology and good accessibility. This is one of the this is one of the disciplines that is the hardest to get into because they are extremely busy and overbooked. But when we think about vestibular disorders, we have to think that not one person can do it all, and it needs to be uh, done in it with a team approach. Um, and we can talk about that even more as we go. I want to highlight that the team approach doesn't mean that everybody needs to be sitting at the same table. A team approach means in your community, you need to identify good actors that can help you care for those patients, even if you're not sitting in the same spot. Well, that's true. And I really like that you identified, you identified a, a large team. And with everything, there's good, better, and best. And some teams don't have all those players. But I think in the future, what I'm seeing is as the evolution of vestibular evaluation and management progresses, the team is larger. Would you agree? I mean, adding psychiatry, psychology, that's fairly a new thing. Nutrition, great, a, a great person to add because we're talking more about lifestyle management of some of these chronic symptoms. So um, I hope that we can talk about your team and as maybe uh, a, an ideal or what a gold standard might be. And then even, you know, at the very least, what what is uh, what is needed. You mentioned why it's important. Um, what about another reason why why it's important? Anybody else have a from a patient perspective? So from the medical and diagnostic perspective, perspective, it's important. And what about for the patient? I, I think sometimes what we see is that patients have seen other specialists and it sometimes is in an isolated situation and they may not have really gotten all of the information that helps guide the best care. Um, and so, and even having specialists available to refer to, and we even have optometry, we have a group in our community uh, that uh, if there are any other ocular motor issues. Um, so. I do think uh, it, because just the three people sitting here can't always comprehensively see um, all of the issues that may be involved or treat all of the issues that are involved, it is important to be able to reach out to those other uh, members, either within uh, your uh, practice or reaching out to the community or the state. Uh, Rebecca's done a great job in reaching out to therapists throughout the state to ensure that we're all so we're all one big team and, and, and really trying to uh, uh, provide the best uh, recommendations and therapy care for uh, our great outcomes. I agree, yeah. this is an excellent point. And I would add that, you know, um, what, what, from the patient perspective, we, we each have different routes of training and different ways of looking at the patient. While I approach it from a medical diagnosis standpoint, Rebecca and physical therapy approaches it from a functional impairment standpoint. And sometimes, you know, we can have the right diagnosis, but we can only treat it by addressing the functional problem. And this is where on your own, the physician is not going to be able to help the patient. Um, yeah. And, uh -huh. So from the physical therapy standpoint, as you all know, Kathleen, so a lot of times we're the first people that they come to for dizziness and they're, uh, we're treating them, but we're not really getting anywhere. We need to have that other, the physician to have a really good, uh, to get that medical diagnosis. Sometimes we need that medication and sometimes we need other testing to be done to 
really formalize that. So that's the one nice thing that be, having a team address, having been out on my own, I was having to find the team. I've known Christine mm -hmm. for about 20 years and I used to be on the outside and I would send to them and try to get to. So it's like, yes, my team is over there and over there and over there, but really finding your resources and building those relationships. Yes. Um, um, the relationship is really, really important um, as you're building on your own. You're thinking, I'm the only one out here treating this. How do I make that happen? And it's just reaching out because there's a lot of folks that, you know, with dizziness, they're not sure what to do. And if they find that you're the person, especially with physical therapy, that will be willing to treat these people and also to get those resources for them, because sometimes it's just the resource. So I think what you're saying, and what I want to clarify for our vestibular patients, vestibular warriors, that's what I'm going to refer to you as, that are listening, you may have access to a multidisciplinary team at a university, a teaching hospital, or a major research center like MUSC and others, or you might have a lead practitioner who specializes in vestibular diagnostic and or rehabilitation. So however the team is assembled, whether it comes as a package under one roof or it's assembled by a lead clinician, it's going to be important. Is that fair to say that it can be assembled? I know for me in my practice, I practice solo. However, I always have access to a multidisciplinary team that is assembled for each client as they come in. So you have the privilege of having an in-house uh, team, but you do pull and, and bring in additional members, or maybe you don't use all the members depending on the case. So this is a customized multidisciplinary approach really, isn't it? It is. And like Christine said, we have access to neurooptometry with a private group in our community that we rely on every now and then when we have a case, especially concussion cases, where we reach out. They're not part of MUSC. They're not part of our they're not on our payroll, they're not sitting on that table, but they, we work closely with them. We've invited them for lectures. So like we, we built those, re, uh, th those relationships over time and, they, and every now and then we reach out to them for access when, we, when a patient needs it. So like us in an academic center, we have to reach out to the community often. It's easily built, I wouldn't say easily, it can be built in the community within your own community. And, I think the patients can drive that. Like if a patient identifies a physical therapist or an MD or an audiologist that is really vested in their improvement, they can, they can help them connect with the other professionals that they've been with. And when you are in a, you know, in, in physical therapy deserts, for example, and we've done a lot of things virtually with physical therapists who are mm. far away from our, from our, from our center, Rebecca does a lot of virtual coaching with physical therapists across the state of South Carolina who don't have an MD sitting next to them. Or maybe not have a comprehensive experience working with some of the more uh, uh, complex cases. They have enough information. They, they know where to start. They just need to have um, some support and, and uh, somebody to provide um, kind of a mentorship for them. Cause we want these people in these, um, as Dr. Rizik says, kind of these deserts, these mm -hmm. uh, that we have. Um, so just reaching out uh, to having somebody that they can reach out to. You know, we already help. have, we already have people in the chat asking how they can see you. So we're gonna talk more about the multidisciplinary team. We're gonna talk about a case, but one of the things I think the reason I bring that up is because you're mentioning telehealth or virtual medicine. And I got to see on, I don't know, one of the social media things, um, a virtual surgery, surgery happening, not a virtual surgery, but a telesurgery where there was a, you know, a surgeon in one part of the world actually operating on a person in the other part of the world. So I know that the world is getting smaller and that's great. And that as much uh, access as patients need to this healthcare we are excited that you are doing also virtual visits. I want um, to clarify, we can only do the virtual visit within the, the state, state of South, South Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. Ah, uh, that's good for used, you to clarify we, that. We used to be able to do it through the COVID pandemic. They allowed us to do virtual visits. So we connected with patients outside the state. Unfortunately, the state of emergency was declared, ended, I think, six months ago. It did. And, You're right. And now I cannot see a patient uh, outside the boundaries of South Carolina virtually, unfortunately. Well, uh, 
Okay, well then I'm just going to go into this question then that someone wrote. They wanted, if they wanted to visit you from out of state, do you coordinate an evaluation? I know many years ago it was always just Mayo Clinic that I would see people from. They'd show up there and they'd get everything done and then I'd get a report and then I'd treat them. So is, is that something court that you coordinate with patients from out of state who want to travel to MUSC Vestibular Diagnostic Lab? We've, not, we've had a lot of people travel from out of state. Usually our philosophy is that we don't test everybody, but if somebody is traveling from a long, long distance and, and, and they cannot, there's impossible to get them back another time, I coordinate testing with Christine so that we make sure it's available. And sometimes during the course of the evaluation, we might end up not doing the full spectrum of testing mm -hmm. if we don't feel it's needed. And then we make sure... Luckily, in my clinic, Rebecca is in my clinic as well. So a patient gets to see the physical therapist when needed at the same time. So we built that model so that we can comprehensively see patients in a single day when we can. And I think that when we uh, see patients uh, that have been with other providers, they can provide us with some of the diagnostic testing they had, and we can review that, and we can fill in any gaps uh, that may not have uh, been evaluated or some specialty equipment that we have or specialty testing or something that we think we may just need to follow up on. They may have had once, but now it's been a, a year or two and we need to see if the status is the same. So we can review the, the incoming information to make some decisions about how we would schedule someone. I think people in the audience need to hear that you don't do testing that you don't feel is necessary. Some people feel they haven't had a comprehensive evaluation unless they've had every single test there is known to man and seen every bell and heard every whistle. But I think that um, you're being you're mentioning being prudent with testing and testing only when necessary. And that's important to hear. You're so am, am I right that you don't have to have everything with every presenting case? Correct. We test about 30% of mm -hmm. patients, not more. And um, we teach courses at our academies about the pitfalls of testing. Mm. Testing serves to answer a specific question. So I only order the test when I have a specific question. I go to Christine and I say, I want to know if this guy has a peripheral vestibular hypofunction, or I want to know before I do that surgery on that Meniere's ear, is the other ear okay? Uh -huh. Or I want to know, is this just purely central or is there a sensory problem in the inner ear on top of that so that I can discuss with PT what they need to do? So, and a lot of times we don't need the testing for the diagnosis, for the diagnosis of the vestibular label that we give. Um, and this is where it's important for the patient. Like I've had patients get frustrated that they drove two hours and I'm not testing them. I don't need to test you to make a diagnosis of vestibular migraine. I don't need to test you to make a diagnosis of Meniere's disease. So, and these are the two most frequent uh, disorders as well as BPPV. We don't need testing for BPPV. These are, we did a study recently about how much those three disorders that I just cited cost the US healthcare system. They cost them in the billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's kind of maddening that these are three diagnoses that are easy to make clinically, but yet they are costing the U.S. healthcare system billions of dollars per year because we are over-testing and over-imaging patients. I can't stop smiling because I wish everyone thought as logically and scientifically as you did because you're employing the scientific method here with I will do a diagnostic test if I have a hypothesis and I need to prove it it's rule something in or something out. I appreciate that and I think that that is um, a very responsible way of practicing going forward certainly with um, being concerned about the cost of health care. So what we're going to do next is we're going to introduce a case and um, if you want to introduce the case first, let's do that. And then we're going to go to each healthcare professional and talk about what your role is in the multidisciplinary team and then what your um, what you add to the case in both your diagnostic and your treatment options. So who has a case they want to start with? Yeah, we're going to talk about a case, actually, a patient we've been planning to present and today completed his testing. He's a 65-year-old patient who presented with an ongoing sensation of imbalance that started about 10 years before he presented to us and gradually getting worse. So he came for balance issues, not dizziness. 
He states that whenever he's walking, he feels like he drifts to the right. Darkness, uneven surfaces make, make it worse, denies any vertigo or movement type, illusion of movement type sensations. Balance improves when he takes his shoes off to walk. He doesn't have symptoms that suggest neuropathy, like numbing, tingling in, it, in its feet, have muscle fatigue at the end of the day. So um, we saw that patient a few weeks ago. He told us he had had uh, already been, uh, in 2014, he was comprehensively evaluated at a big medical center uh, in a different state. He had vestibular testing and was told everything, and an MRI and was told everything uh, was negative. On the exam, we suspected that there might be a vestibular dysfunction. And if I'm reading back my, my initial impression, I said this patient probably has bilateral hypofunction based on the symptoms and my clinical exam. I'm going to start him on physical therapy and I'm going to do vestibular testing. If the vestibular testing doesn't confirm a vestibular dysfunction, then I'll refer him to neurology to look for sensory neuropathy, even if he doesn't have symptoms. So we decided to start with what was accessible to us, PT uh, and audiology, and audiology was done today. Yes, so I think, um, again, for this patient who had previous testing and also based on the examination, a full uh, a, a, a video nystagmography was not ordered. Uh, we were looking at tests that likely weren't available or that definitely weren't available in 2014, which is the video head impulse test, which is just a formalized um, measurement uh, quali uh, uh, qualifying and quantifying the eye movements, uh, which might be a little different from the clinical test where it's more observational. Uh, uh, so we did a video head impulse test and um, vestibular evoked biogenic potential to really look at all five organs of the inner ear uh, and then follow up from there. And so uh, the results of that test in indeed showed bilateral hypofunction, but oftentimes if, we're, if you're looking, even with the video nystagmography, you're looking at the horizontals, uh, you're looking at one part of the ear, and we could really tell by this uh, evaluation that really the whole system was affected, all of the organs, uh, except for um, part of the VEMP, which is likely why he was doing as well as he was, uh, was normal. So that certainly, I think, then provides, even though physical therapy, I'm sure just uh, him walking in the door, they could identify the issue. It really, I think, uh, showed the uh, how much of the system was uh, affected and then certainly can affect how they're going to manage the treatment options as far as uh, compensation or substituting different uh, strategies for maintaining balance. You want to comment? Yeah, so from, for this patient, this patient does not live locally, but he lives a couple hours from here. But this would be a patient from a physical therapy standpoint that we need to maximize um, his vestibular system as well as functional system. So we want to work on his balance. We want to work on his postural stability. We want to work on his walking. What are those things? That, so he likes to walk without his shoes on. Is that because he feels more stable and, you know, going through those things that we need to look at from a functional perspective, because we want as physical therapists, we want him to be maximizing his independence and doing the things that he wants to do. Looking at assistive devices if we need to, to be able to do the things that he wants to be able to do, but also working on those strategies, substitution strategies, and any kind of um, habituation that we can further, um, you know, kind of push. So in this situation, because he lives so far away, it would be for me to reach out to that therapist that he's going to be working with to know what the testing indicated um, and kind of go through what the plan of care would start to look like now, now that they have more of a, a, a diagnosis to really work, look at. And, um, you know, we, we chose that case because bilateral vestibular hypofunction is a devastating diagnosis. And it's often not picked up because people are not thinking about it. These are patients who sometimes travel to, you know, to multiple physicians and multiple PT. And the PT wants to help them and they do general balance exercises. 
But as long as they don't have the diagnosis of BVH, the ones who are not experienced at least in vestibular disorders might not know to start substitution strategies. And this is where everything comes together. You need a diagnosis, you can suspect it medically, confirm it with audiology, and then start the treatment plan with the rehab treatment plan and refine it uh, with the PT. And I think from a standpoint with uh, the PT part is, if they're in a location that have some experience, they're doing VOR and they're doing VOR and that person is just moving that head and moving that head and they're feeling worse or they just can't get it. And that's where we, we can provide that information back to say, you know, we need to go slow and slow and see how well they do. It's about keeping that fixation in that target. It's not about having to go fast if you can't maintain that visual stabilization. And I do want to bring up one other issue that he had a concern with, which was um, sometimes when he's driving, this is a man that's kind of compensated somewhat on his own, uh, but had a couple of issues that he said, is this, you know, I get some anxiety going over bridges or when I'm in a in construction zone. Um, and he was wondering if that was, you know, what, should he be treated for that or, you know, was it a, you know, and so certainly um, I said, I did refer him to Dr. Rizik about, okay, but it's not uncommon because of his issue to have problems when your visual field might be compromised in some way. And yes. so I think that was another, it was very um, transparent of him to even mention his uh, concern right. about anxiety and dizzy, uh, mm -hmm. and driving. So I think what you're, you're saying that is that in the approach where everyone gets to look at the client from their certain perspective, it gives you an idea about what you can treat and what you can't retreat. But I think you also alluded to the fact that it helps you determine prognosis. And in this case, especially, did the diagnosis change your prognosis for therapy or treatment um, based on what you found? Of course. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, I think, and we know that clinically that, you know, from recovery from a unilateral vestibular weakness is very different outcome than that from a bilateral hypofunction. It is. That's important. And, and, it, and luckily these are rare disorders, but again, none of the ones I've seen were on anybody's radar until everything else was exhausted, which is fine. Like you have to rule out the important stuff, but then you have that patient in front of you and what can you do? You can offer them some measure of relief with rehab and you can make sure there's nothing else brewing underneath that. I do want, Kathleen, I do want to answer a question that I saw on the chat. Yes, yes. So Thank you. first of all, uh, that's not true. Uh, I've had a lot of patients go on disability without me doing a single- Let me bring, let me bring the question back. <laughs> okay, okay so let me see. It said, Jody says, unfortunately, for those of us who can't work due to our condition, disability companies and social security want tests to show something's wrong, not a subjective diagnosis. Now, this is in response to when we were talking about you don't over test, you test yes. only when you need to, but that doesn't mean that you're making only a subjective diagnosis. So go Correct. ahead, Dr. Rizik. That's what this was in response to. Thank you. Correct. So it's a clinical diagnosis. And I mm -hmm. think in this day and age, we forget that clinic is the most important, the clinical diagnosis is this, the most important aspect of treating a patient. Images and MRIs sometimes are done to rule out certain things. The majority of those diagnoses don't have a single abnormality on testing, and the testing may not advance your claim to disability in any way. Actually, it might hurt it because it if, it shows if it shows 100% <laughs> function is normal, Mm -hmm. You're going to have, okay, how do you rate this according exactly. to the AMA criteria? So, so that's, this, is, this is not a, a, an accurate statement. But yes, disability is hard to get, mm -hmm. and it would require multiple iterations. Uh, eventually, some patients who truly are deserving of it because of this condition will be able to prove their claim. And VIDA has a, yes. work, a toolkit that, you know, we can, I don't know if you want to do the plugin for it, but they have a toolkit that will help you prepare for your disability. And of course, we, you know, it needs to be valid and it needs to be a valid yes. diagnosis with valid impairment. And this is another uh, area where you need the input of the PT for functional impairment in addition Absolutely. to the diagnosis. 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, that's important. And in uh, I have provided expert testimony on numerous cases um, to support a patient's disability claim when their testing proved negative. So I don't think that all vestibular warriors quite understand, nor do all lawyers and judges, um, that vestibular testing is not comprehensive in nature and positive or I mean, and negative vestibular function testing does not necessarily exclude the presence of a vestibular disorder. Does that make sense? That's a mouthful. You might have to rewind that and hear that again, but in the presence of all normal vestibular function testing, there still can be vestibular impairment that causes functional disability. So again, I mean, I think that's a really important case. You're delineating, differentiating between a subjective opinion and a clinical diagnosis, and those are not the same. A clinical diagnosis is a valid diagnosis, tests and measures um, still without diagnostic uh, technology. Okay, thank you. That was really, really important. Back to the, uh, back to the, to the case. Um, so each of you have your own role in diagnosis and treatment and identifying um, what needs to be done. And then I like that you work with their hometown therapist if they need to, or even with their hometown physician, if you hand them off to that. What could a patient who comes to your clinic, to your program, expect in terms of triage, evaluation and management? And tell people what triage means if you do that. So um, in our clinic, when we decided to establish it in 2015, I'm an ENT, a neuroautologist. We decided to build the vestibular program. And the reason was, is that as ENT, we were getting those referrals and those patients didn't have a home to go back to. Like there was no central person taking care of them who would make a diagnosis of vestibular migraine, but we would have a wait list of nine months for have to have a neurologist treated. And vestibular migraine has over the years become part of what we as ENT learn how to manage the ones who want to, uh, we have access to courses in our academy. So we decided to be the house of the vestibular patient in our area. So the triage happens with us, meaning we're the one who treats those patients. And if we need additional help, we send them to specific identified people within each divisions, uh, mostly within our program when we can, if it's a complicated diagnosis or locally with local neurologists when we need to. Um, so when somebody comes to see us, I mean, we get like the referral I read you, you would say, why did this guy end up in an ENT clinic? They ended up in a balance and dizziness clinic and they had imbalance. They didn't have any single mention of vertigo or dizziness. And yet it ended up being an inner ear disorder. We wanted to be able to capture those patients because they would go unnoticed otherwise. So a patient comes to us, usually uh, they're first seen by myself. Uh, on many occasions, I don't order anything more than a hearing test at the first visit. If there is something where I want, like the patient lives locally and I want PT to be plugged in immediately, Rebecca comes in and does her evaluation. Every now and then, I don't want a full test, but I want a quick a screener. Or is there anything in the vestibular system that is amiss? And I want, for example, a video head impulse test, which is a 10, 15 minute test. I call on Christine and I say, can you squeeze in that? patient for a video head impulse test to get us started. But a lot of times we just do our initial workup uh, and then we bring the patient back after we decide what the management is, if it's a medical management, medical plus PT. And, or the dietitian. Or, and the diet, thank you. And then on and off over the years, we've had dietitians. Luckily we have, again, funding for a dietitian who's with us once, once, a, once a week. She sees all my migraine and many years patients and does virtual visits with them and do work on compliance on diet. So in those instances, after I leave the room, the dietitian enters the room and goes over the migraine and many years diet when this is the diagnosis. So it's a busy day when you come to see us. We're never on time. And it's patients okay. complain, but it is what it is. Uh, you get a one-stop shop in a way on one day as much as we can. And then if we need testing, we bring them back on a day where the testing, most of the time I try to make sure that I'm there to review testing with them or we do a virtual visit to catch up on the testing results. It's enough, coordina it's enough coordination to do all of that, to have a coordinator 
try to put all that together once they've had a clinical medical evaluation to uh, put together uh, the other referrals, which might include radiology, audiology. Uh, and so, it, yes, it's, I would say for some of the more complicated cases, it might be more of a two visit uh, uh, type of treat, you know, the yep. initial triage and, and then the decision to treat or, and or test. Are medical records reviewed prior to someone coming to see you? It depends on the case. Quite honestly, um, we, we kind of always, almost always a final stop. And um, so I don't screen uh, the, the medical records to decide whether or not I see a patient. And over the years, we, you know, people know to send me the patients where they cannot solve the problem of their dizziness and balance. And I always feel like I learn more from the patient the first five minutes of their encounter than I've than any medical record. And yes, as Christine said before, before I order additional tests, I make sure that this test was not done before. And you know, I end up reviewing the older MRIs and the older uh, vestibular testing when available before deciding if I need anything more. I try to reduce redundancy. There is a question from the chat about um, whether or not vestibular disorders can be related to heart surgery. Uh, let me see. And that they've had symptoms onset after, you know, a heart um, thing. Anyway, with, with these, the way we're summarizing these, I can't see them. Is there a link between open heart surgery causing vestibular issues? My symptoms started after my surgery two years ago and haven't gone away. So what if a person wonders if it's you know, a, a cardiac relationship. It's a, exactly, and this is a complicated. It's a, co a complicated question. Of course, I've had over the years patients who their symptoms presented initially, immediately after a bypass surgery, and the problem is, and again, everybody tells them it's not that, or you didn't have a stroke. But sometimes you can have a low perfusion pressure during the surgery, and you have some changes at the level of the brain and the vulnerable areas like the inner ear, who, who receive very tenuous uh, blood flow, could have been affected. So, you know, while I cannot comment on that case specifically, I can say we can have vestibular disorders due to blood flow changes after an open heart surgery. I could, I also say you can have other types of dizziness following open heart surgery, not related to vestibular. It could be just cardiac deconditioning. Like, you know, everybody should have cardiac rehab after those type of procedures. Sometimes they fall off the wagon or they don't keep up with that. So a lot of times I make a diagnosis of physical deconditioning, even if I don't find a vestibular disorder underneath. And maybe Rebecca, you can comment on yeah, that. Yeah, so in that, in that situation, Dr. Rizik would um, provide that referral for us and we're gonna go through functional measures. We're gonna see if we can, um, where the, that disease occurs. Is it something that's positional? Could it be blood pressure related, you know, dropping, those kinds of things? or deconditioning, and we're gonna work on those things to provide that information. And the nice thing is that we can provide that information right back to Dr. Rizik. If he's having that patient come back in, we can provide some of that information that we are having to see at that same time. So if it's not a, uh, at the time of vestibular, we can't find a vestibular diagnosis as we're working with them, we might start to see some of those things trickling in that we can actually provide that information to also. So I, I, to piggyback on that, I often say, I wouldn't say often, but you know, I say to patients oh, who tell me I don't believe in PT. And I say, well, you know, we're not going to go into if, <laughs> if you believe in it or not, but at least PT will give me enough. Sometimes I don't have enough just going from your symptoms and I need to see you in dynamic and, and during the rehab, the PT can elicit symptoms and can elicit patterns that will guide us through the diagnosis and through the prognosis. So um, this is another way to tell you how sometimes my, my initial evaluation can be limited and I rely on my other colleagues from other disciplines to complete my evaluation and my, how I see the patient as a whole. So it's important that to, to illustrate this, that PT Again, the, I don't think PT can work without MD, but I don't think MD can work without PT as well. And it's been over the years a subject of contentious debate. Even on the advertisement for this course, 
I saw some Facebook comments when we were initially we were going to do it in August that somebody said all of those MDs are not worth it. Only chiropractors and PTs helped me. Well, that's great that you found somebody that helped you, but that's not what we are uh, wanting to do. We want to make sure that people are comprehensively evaluated and taken care of. And I think the other nice thing is, is um, as we're getting these patients worked, uh, we're working with them from the PT standpoint, and we have a kind of a working diagnosis, and we're not sure, and they're not moving. We're not, we're not getting better. You know, we're, we're still kind of trudging in the same. I can come back to Dr. Rizik and say, you know what, we're just not getting anywhere. I don't want anybody to have to come over and over and over because you have to come two to three times a week. I want to make it very comprehensive for that patient. And if we're not moving forward in those directions, I need to report back to him saying, you know, we're, we're stuck here. And so I'm not sure what's happening. And so a lot of times we'll get them back in to see Dr. Rizek um, so that we can look further at, you know, another reason why they're not moving forward with their physical therapy um, and their symptoms. Let me let me il- use a case to illustrate this. Um, mm-hmm. We had uh, a 35 year old patient with a history of canal wall down surgery for cholesteatoma, which is an extensive skin cyst behind the ear done a few years ago. Uh, the, you know, usually those require frequent follow ups for cleaning, making sure there's no recurrences. And the patient, you know, kind of uh, is lost to follow up and comes back because he's dizzy. He's been having his, uh, you know, uh, he's, he's been having his ear checked uh, locally. So, as we're examining him, because of the extent of the surgery and the type of symptoms he had, my initial uh, clinical diagnosis, as I was talking with him, that he probably lost some function in the inner ear, given the multitude of surgeries he's had. And then um, I sit down and clean his ear, and as I'm cleaning his ear with the suction, he started getting dizzy. So I said, maybe he has a fistula because those skin cysts are notorious to cause erosion of bone. And the area where I was working was very close to the inner ear. And as I was laying him back, he he looked like he had BPPD. So he had all the gamut of vestibular disorders. I lean him back because I always do my full evaluation the same way. You know, it's a 10 minute dizziness exam in a way, like I do it in a systematic fashion on everybody. So this guy had a potential three diagnoses, left hypofunction, like inner ear weakness, benign positional vertigo, and then um, a fistula. So to go from there, first thing I did, I called PT and I said, I think he may have BPPV, can we do an Epley maneuver? And as soon as we're done, I want to do a fistula test in clinic. Sure enough, he did the Epley, he was extremely nauseated with the Epley, we had to bring him back after a week and do the fistula test. Superior canal. Superior canal, yeah. yeah. So he had a very unusual type of BPPV called superior canal BPPV. The eyes were beating in a very non-traditional way. And then the week later, when he came back to do the fistula test, the fistula test was positive. If you are a physical therapist working on that patient on your own without MD support, you probably would have diagnosed the BPPV and treated it. But you need to identify somebody to help you get to the diagnosis of fistula test. You can connect with a local vestibular audiologist who's good at those tests and can help you figure that out. And you need to also make sure that you're not missing anything else medical. Sometimes some of those patients come and they've had 21 sessions of Epley's. And finally they said, the patient said enough, I need to see someone else for this. And, you know, and they had a fistula that was lurking beneath or they had a vestibular migraine that was making their positional symptoms worse, but they didn't have ongoing BPPV. So this is why it's important for every one of our disciplines to know the limits of what we can offer and the scope of our practice. Absolutely. Shame on the therapist who saw someone for 21 times for BPPV. (laughs) Well, you, you brought up something that actually at the exact same time you were talking about it, a comment came in and I think you've answered it, but Randy says if complicated or chronic patients demonstrating several diagnoses. Is there an order? And I think your answer is it takes the team, use the team. And of course, I always talk about it like peeling an onion. You're going to use, fix the easiest thing first. And if you can fix positional vertigo and 
then look at what's underneath, you're going to do that. So it probably depends on the diagnosis, doesn't it? But that you certainly will peel them away one at a time. It does. And you need a person championing your problem in your community. And it could be in our community, it ended up being us. But in your community, it could be you in Houston. And then you have the networking with the MDs and the audiologists to guide the patient. So again, um, there's we need to understand that this is not going to be achieved. We cannot help the patients by working in a, in a, in a, silo. In a silo. Yeah. What about, you know, we've talked about patients in general, but what about specific pediatrics? Here's a 13 year old with vestibular migraines. Does your program see kiddos and what is different about seeing them? So, yeah, there's a little bit of difference. We don't see a pediatric in a great volume, but that being said, we've recruited a pediatric audiologist who is working on growing the pediatric vestibular program. We are a big cochlear implant center, so we do, you know, we are starting to test a lot of those patients for associated balance disorders. We've also established, we're starting to establish a network of pediatric occupational therapists and vestibular therapists that can help us take care of those patients because that's where in pediatrics it's a little bit different than in, adult, in adults. In adults, you have the neuro PT group. And then they can silo and specialize into the vestibular. But in the pediatric world, that's even fewer of them. So it's extremely uh, hard to establish the rehab plan. And I let Rebecca talk about it. The other thing is that the diagnosis in vestibular, the vestibular disorder diagnosis in kids, unfortunately, in the severe cases is shadowed by the other severe comorbidities. Patients basically have other things on their plate when they are born with all of those developmental issues. And the ones that are more benign end up being under the spectrum of migraine for the most part. And like I see that case that you um, that you presented, that's the most frequent cause of benign vestibular disorder in kids. And yes, we treat them. I try in, in children, we try to avoid pharmacological. I'm gonna answer this question and answer yours. For this specific case you put up, we try to avoid uh, pharmacological medication unless absolutely needed. We rely on therapy, on mindfulness, on, on uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to treat those patients. Uh, so in, in the pediatric vestibular programs are even rarer than regular vestibular programs and teams, but personally we are working on growing it because we see the need. And I would say we don't have, I don't have as much experience with it as I have in adults. And I think it's important to remember that there aren't real clinical guidelines for all these things. Like you talked about, centers are still developing experience, exper expertise in certain areas and the volume of pediatric vestibular patients is just smaller. So we don't all have formal uh, protocols and programs in place. Here's someone else asking about sort of maybe an experimental treatment. Audiology, can you answer this question for Dr. Strange? Prescribing hearing aids to patients for balance disorders? Um, certainly not with normal hearing that I'm aware of. Um, we do, you know, promote uh, hearing aids for people that have uh, hearing loss and balance disorders because even though uh, hearing isn't one of the Trinity hallmarks of balance function, looking at vestibular, visual, and proprioception, we certainly also use our hearing uh, to manage our environment, to know how close things might be getting to us, or if they're coming from the left or to the right, uh, so we have time to respond if we have a vestibular disorder. So um, that's an interesting question, um, and I can appreciate that because there's certainly sometimes discussion about some sensory issues in normal hearing, but I've never seen it in the context of a balance disorder with normal hearing and hearing aids. But absolutely, with hearing loss, uh, and balance disorders, uh, we do talk, and even sometimes with our cochlear implant patients, uh, we sometimes have considerations of their hearing loss being different in both ears uh, when they also have balance disorders. 
I know we're in, we're, we're nearing the end of our hour. This has been an amazing conversation and there's a few more questions that we may not be able to get an answer to all of them, but um, we've, you've established and set a good case for why a multidisciplinary approach is better. Um, if it's better, why is it not the norm? And do you think we'll get there? There's not enough of us, uh, of her and of her. Uh, vestibular audiology is, you know, maybe each one of you can comment on vestibular training and each of those master or graduate programs. Well, certainly, I think uh, when you're looking at uh, some of the subspecialties within my profession, you do seek outside uh, education beyond your um, clinical doctorate to specialize but I will also say it can be difficult to find the support within a team. A single expert sometimes is difficult then to make those connections. If, if as an audiologist, you, you might be the one in the community that understands some of these things that then you try to find a physician that will also work with you when you think of things like vestibular migraine or a PT that might be able to work with you when talking about some central disorder um, treatments that aren't necessarily traditional like BPPB. I think from the physical therapy standpoint, it's just having that background and um, usually in neurology. And then there are coursework out there. I, you know, through the APTA, there's many courses um, that provide um, the education. I always say it's, it's like you said earlier, Kathleen, it's like peeling an onion. You, you're not going to get it all right at the beginning. And it's just having the passion for it and over time, uh, that experience um, uh, working with these patients. Well, final thoughts and comments for you guys. I wanted to, to give you a chance to do that, but first, wait, I thought oh, one more thing I wanted to say. Um, what, since there's not enough of us, there's not enough vestibular specialists, that is true. While people are waiting for a diagnosis from your center or from a local MD or an MD that they visit in another place, do you advocate and support the use of rehabilitation while they wait for those functional problems that may present imbalance or dizziness or, you know, do you, because the evidence is supporting um, early intervention for vestibular rehabilitation. And I think that um, in my experience and the patient's experiences, they're advocating for, yes, help me get some relief with strategies while I wait. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's a kind of a double, a double, uh, edge sword. A double edged sword because I see the other part of it where patients have gone to the wrong therapist. Not that the therapist didn't want to help them, but didn't have the expertise. And they ended up having a completely negative reaction to PT. Whereas, you know, and also they may develop aversion to going to PT and that doesn't advance their case. Or like the case I talked about, which is not uncommon, mm -hmm. where they go back and forth, back and forth, the same therapy practice without improvement. And yes, it is a reality that this ends up being, uh, you know, it's not rare patients that go through this. So... But if I, if I know that somebody is waiting to see me and I know that somebody like Rebecca is able to see them sooner, 100%, I would support that. And I have, we have, with time, built that community in, in, across the state where I know like somebody cannot wait and they text me if I'm on a cancellation list. And I say, you know what, go see Sandy and Michelle in Merle's Inlet. You know, go see Amy in Spartanburg while you're waiting to see me because they can get you started, they can do the evaluation, yeah. they can give me additional information by the time you see me. But the truth is I cannot recognize that this should be the norm because I cannot vet everybody's capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, so actually, what you're saying is you're just using your multidisciplinary team. That's what you're doing. You're using your multidisciplinary team approach to say this may be appropriate for this patient who presents with dizziness when they roll in bed, you know, yes. and you and you make that decision. Well, that's that's a good point. I'm sorry. What you're going to say. So for the sole practitioner that's out there that's treating this, this patient um, and is, you know, this vestibular patient, what I always say is is usually within your community as a therapist, if you don't feel comfortable, usually within that community, there's somebody that does feel or, or is more comfortable and just referring that patient to that person. It's just like I always say is, 
Yes, I'm a physical therapist. Can I treat your back? Yes. Do you want me to? No. It's because it's not what I do all day. So usually within these in these communities, there are people out there. It's just having those resources that, you know, your, your therapist, having those resources and using those resources for your patient to get them started. Because I always say the sooner we can get them in, the sooner we can get them going. Um, yeah. What I worry about on the other side is the person not moving. And so then we get, you know, we get another kind of problem going cardiovascularly, endurance wise, mm. and not wanting to move because they have figured out if I don't move, I'm better. And so it's kind of the yin and yang of it all. Mm. But it's just providing for the sole practitioner out there that's really trying to help their patient is trying to identify those people within their community. And uh, well, and, uh huh. Can I add one thing? I know we're getting close to the hour because that answers that last question I'm seeing about what advice you can, a patient can do to educate their primary or other yes. doctors. Yes. I mean, you know, there, well, when we established the clinic, we also made a point that we're going to continue talking to the referring providers. And over the years, I've been happy to see that whether it's my residents or the primary care who referred to me, sometimes they've started somebody on medication for vestibular migraine or Meniere's disease before they send them our way. So uh, you have, and a patient can be their own advocate, you know, a primary care physician who's slammed by 50 patients a day and doesn't have time to look into this rare disorder and, you know, that they don't know anything about. You can be your, your own advocate, bring some VIDA literature, uh, check on VIDA for directory for surrounding PT and say, you know what, I think this could be a person that I can maybe can get me going. So, and the, the, the everybody wants to help the patient that is in front of them. Sometimes they don't know where to start. So not doing a plugin necessarily just for Vida, but Vida is a good resource to know who is available and who's interested in doing things uh, related to vestibular patients. Absolutely. And you can plug Vida because this is a Vida pro podcast <laughs> and video presentation. In fact, I was saying, when I look at the comments that come in and the questions, they're all really, really good questions. And Vida does have more resources than you would ever imagine to answer almost all of these questions. It's great to have a panel and to engage with the public. We love doing that. Um, but use Vita, and I know that we'll be trying to fill in on the comments where you can find specific resources with the Vestibular Disorders Association. So um, I know that Vita is grateful for the work you're doing to lead the board of directors. Dr. Rizik, it was a privilege to have your team, a part of your team, on today for this conversation. And I know that, the, that you've started a great amount of dialogue that should continue in the community about the importance of the multidisciplinary team, the value of each individual one, and how really new the field of vestibular medicine is, that we are still establishing what even credentials a real vestibular healthcare professional, what are those clinical guidelines that we'd want to propose to just establish best practices of care. These are all still in development. So as the public out there and as our audience has dialogue about this is the right way, this is the right way, this is, it's all still in the works. You're in sort of the evolution of vestibular healthcare as a field, vestibular medicine as a problem and a group of diagnoses, and certainly vestibular diagnostics as the technology improves. So if we don't have the answers, it's because nobody does. There's a lot of still unknown in this field, and that's why it requires a whole bunch of brain power to give you guys the best care you can. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for joining us. And we hope that you'll join us again on making vestibular 